Hi all, let's talk about how you clear DP900 in 3 days. We are going to talk about the exam, resources as timeline, exam cram, that is the things which you must remember for this exam. So the exam name is DP900, which is Microsoft Azure Data Fundamental. It is a category of fundamental exam. There is no expiry date for this kind of certification. About questions, I got 48 questions. All were multiple choice, drop down to complete sentences, type of question, match combination and true false. The time was 45 minutes and I was done in 20 minutes. It was pretty quick, straightforward, 48 questions. There were no labs. The cost for this exam is $99, but there is a free Microsoft training option is there. Once you attend that training, you get a free exam washer and that way you get this exam for $0. I'll put a link for that in the description and you can definitely avail that offer along with multiple other fundamental exams. Now let's talk about preparation and timeline. So for this exam, for the main preparation and high level understanding, I went through Microsoft Learn option, which is absolutely free. Let me show you how it looks. So this is DP900 page from Microsoft. And uh, if you scroll down here, you will see this learning path. There are four modules. I've been to all those four modules. You just click start. As you can see at the top of every module, it tells time. It says around 25 minutes, but generally it went faster for me. And you just go through and uh, read it through. Mostly it is reading, but somewhere it will be practical options also there. You may or may not need to go to that practical option. And at the end, pretty much you have to have knowledge for all of these so that uh, you can check and try some answers. So this way you end up spending four to six hours in Microsoft Learn to prepare for this exam. One tip for labs is there. There are a lot of labs they have put there. I mean, if you want to do it, do it. It's not mandated because in the exam, there are no labs and it won't be asked what you will click next and all like some other exams. So don't worry about too much about the labs. But you can do it if you like to do it, not for the exam, it's mandatory in the Microsoft Learn learning path. Then practice test, which are totally optional. You may try one test if you want, but you can safely skip it as long as you have gone through Microsoft Learn and are able to retain the important points. I have covered those important points in the cram also in this video. But if you want to take a test, put one hour for that. And after that, you can revise some of the things which you want to revise put one hour for that and cram a few things which I'm going to discuss. So that takes you one hour. Lab practice onto the portal is again optional. But if you want to try it out, definitely spare one hour for that. And the exam itself, it is a 45 minutes exam, but give one hour for that. So in that way, it is around eight to 10 hours of work. And um, in my case, I did first day I did uh, the Microsoft learning. I went through that. And uh, then the next two days, I split the remaining tasks. So I was easily able to do it in three days. So you can also plan it out same way and easily do it in two to three days. Now let's talk about exam cram. That what are the few things which as per my experience, you got to cram for this exam. So at the top, you will see four areas. We'll start with core data concepts. And that's why you see a green dot there. So I will go through few items which you should remember for this exam. Let's start with relational database platform option. As you see, there are three options: PaaS, which is platform as service, IES, infrastructure as a service, and physical server on premises. And if you see at the bottom, as you go on the right, administrator effort increases. And as you go top, capital expenditure day-to-day -day control increases. So for example, if you are in PaaS, which is the bottom left side, there is minimum admin effort. And at the same time, you have minimum day to day control. And you have less capital expenses because you don't pay a lot in the start, but you pay as you go. Same way IES stay in between and physical, you have a lot of admin effort. And at the same time, you have good amount of capital expenditure and you get good day to day control. So there could be question around this. Keep this uh, diagram in mind. Continuing to that, now what is the difference between on-premises and cloud? So on-premises, personal control of data security, you get in on-premises. Scalable, cloud is more scalable. Hardware maintained, that's there in cloud. Software maintained, that's there in cloud. Low capital expenditure in cloud because you don't spend a lot of money in the start. Low operational expenditure on-premises because once you put a money, the operational expenditure on-premises are less compared to cloud. 
So you should remember these points. There could be questions around that. Moving on data analytics. There are two things ETL and ELT. So you should remember what it is. ETL is extract transform load and ELT is extract load transform as a name suggests as well as as shown in the diagram in both the approaches extract happen first that we extract the data from the sources then in ETL we transform it first we do basic filtering and transformation and then we load whereas in ELT we load as is extracted data and then we do the transformation now there are good amount of questions around that like what is the difference is what is what so there is a table at the bottom where some of these are captured which you should remember improved data privacy and compliance so ETL has better data privacy and compliance compared to ELT because you only send the filter data so you can filter some data which you don't want to send second is data lake support ELT provides data lake support then does not require special skill ETL it does not require specialist skills so which one is ideal for large volume data that is ELT so this point you should remember for the exam so we do a lot of analytics on the data whether it is graphical or looking at the data differently so there are five categories and the type of uh, analytics which we do and these are descriptive diagnostic predictive prescriptive and cognitive so you got to remember what is the purpose of each and some examples on that because there could be question okay in this situation what kind of analysis would be done or a graph is given asking what kind of analytics is this as the name suggests descriptive helps answer question about what has happened based on historical data for example organization sale report it is descriptive analytics diagnostic helps answer question about why things happened for example why sale of one product is high predictive analysis is it helps answer question about what will happen in the future like how the sale will go in next three months prescriptive analysis helps answer questions about what action should be taken to achieve a goal or target for example where to focus to improve the sale to meet target cognitive it helps to draw inferences from existing data and patterns for example using nlp which is natural language processing to make sense of data for example call center conversation log or product review trying to get sense from that data is a type of cognitive analytics so you got to remember about this then there are some data visualization options these are pretty straightforward but you should remember when to use what like bar and column charts it enables you to see how the set of variable changes across different categories line chart emphasizes the overall shape of the entire series of value usually over time matrix it's a visual table structure that summarizes data key influencer key influencer chart displays a major contributor to a selected result or value tree map are charts of color rectangle with size represent the relative value of each item larger the box higher the value scattered chart shows the relationship between two numerical values as shown an example here then we have field map chart if you have a geographical data you can use field map to display how value differ in proportion across a geographical region pretty quick but uh, you should have an idea on this then a little bit about azure storage type there are like what kind of storage type is there lrs is local redundant storage as shown in the small diagram here there are three copies maintained within the single region then we have zrs which is zone redundant storage here also we have three copies across separate availability zone within a single region then you have grs which is global redundant storage or ragrs which is read only global redundant storage in this case we have six copies total including three in primary region and three in secondary region so it is region independent and the final one is geo zone redundant storage or read access geo zone redundant storage here we have six copies total including three across separate availability zone in the primary region and three local redundant copies in the secondary region so you should have basic understanding of this and for example if you want to have regional redundancy then what options you have and i have put some other parameters in the table you can go through those and keep them in mind then relational database on azure 
Here we are going to talk about first Azure SQL Data Services. Here a table defines what is Azure SQL DB, what it is used for. And then we have MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL. So Azure SQL DB, it's best for modernization at scale with low cost effort. Good for application that require high availability. It has built in high availability. It can use Azure Defender for security purpose. It includes a managed backup service. So these are the feature of Azure SQL DB, which you should remember. MySQL, it's very popular. It's available as free community edition or paid for more functional standard and enterprise edition. Azure Database for SQL is based on the free community edition, but adds high availability and scalability. MariaDB is uh, compatible with Oracle databases. It has built-in support for temporal data. PostgreSQL can store both rational and non-rational data, can store geometric data. It's extensible. So these are the few points you should remember. Again, another point to remember is if your system uses features such as linked server, service broker, or database mail, then you should use manage instance because none of the above four mentioned will support it. Then you need a manage instance to support that. Then there is a tool which is called Azure Data Studio, which you should remember. It's a cross-platform database tool for both on-premises and cloud data platforms. And it works on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So these are the features. When we should use Azure Data Studio, if you are mostly editing or executing queries, if you need the ability to quickly chart and visualize the result set, or if you need to run on Mac OS and Linux. Similar tool as you would know, we have SQL Server Management Studio, which is a pretty heavyweight tool. And when we should use that versus Data Studio, these are the few points also you should remember. We should use that if you are doing complex admin work or platform configuration. If you are doing security management, including user management, vulnerability assessment, and configuration of security feature, or if you need to make use of performance tuning advisor or dashboard, for those kind of heavy admin kind of tasks, you should use SQL Server Management Studio. But for other lightweight cross-platform, use Azure Data Studio. So remember these points, these will be helpful. Then there is DDL and DML statement. Data definition language is called DDL. Data manipulation language is called DML. So make sure you remember what is the difference and the example. Like delete, insert, update. When you're actually deleting, is that you're updating the data that is DML. And on the left hand side, when you define the data structure or the tables, that is DDL. Like alter, create, drop, rename, etc. are the DDL command. Make sure you go through these ones and are able to identify which command is DM and DDL. Talking about non-traditional data on Azure, we have Azure table storage. We should remember the use cases. It is used for very large volumes of data, up to several hundred terabytes in size. It is used for storing databases that don't require complex join, foreign keys or store procedure. And that can be denormalized for fast access. In an IoT system, you might use this to capture device sensor data. As I have shown, this is how Azure table storage looks like. You will have a row key ID and associated value for that. And those row keys can be partitioned using partition key. So keep this structure in mind, partition keys, row key and value. Now blob storage, there are three kind of blobs, which you should remember block blob, page blob, and append blob. So block blob is handled as a set of blocks. Each block can vary in size up to 100 MB. These are best used to store discrete large binary object that change infrequently. Page blob on the other side is organized as a collection of fixed size 512 byte pages. A page block can hold up to 8 terabyte of data. Azure uses page blobs to implement virtual disk storage for virtual machines. Append blob is a block blob optimized to support append operation. You can only add blocks to the end of the append blob. Updating or deleting existing blocks is not supported. Now this blobs sits in Azure storage account under containers. So that's how the structure looks like I have put pointed it there and containers. As I mentioned, inside an Azure storage account, you create blobs inside containers. So keep that in mind. Azure Cosmos, there are a lot of things to learn about it. But one thing to remember about this is it support different kind of APIs, which is application programming interface. 
that enables you to access these documents using a set of well-known interfaces. The APIs that Cosmos DB currently support includes SQL API, Table API, MongoDB API, Cassandra API, and Gremlin API. So you should uh, remember about these. For example, SQL API, the interface provides a SQL-like query language over documents, enabling to identify and retrieve document using select statement. So you should remember that. Table API enables you to use Azure Table Storage API to store and retrieve documents. MongoDB is another well-known document data type with its own programming interface, which can be connected using MongoDB API. Cassandra API for CosmoDB provides a Cassandra-like programming interface for CosmoDB. As you know, Cassandra is a column family database management system. So you can connect that using Cassandra API. Gremlin API implements a graph database interface to CosmoDB. Again, a graph is a collection of data object and directed relationship. So those kind of structure you can connect using Gremlin API. So you should remember these APIs. Now a few pointers about analytics workload on Azure, which is a final section is Azure Data Factory. So what is Azure Data Factory? It's described as a data integration service. It uses number of different resources, which are listed here, which you should remember. Linked services, data sets and pipeline. Linked services provides the information needed for factory to connect to a source or destination. So this data factory connect to different sources using linked services. For example, Azure block storage, linked service to connect to a storage account to data factory. Azure SQL database, linked service to connect to SQL databases. So that is how it connects to the sources. Now data set, it represents the data that you want to ingest or store. Data set store information about the data. And then pipeline is a logical grouping of activity that together perform a task. So these are the three different resources you should remember under Azure Data Fact. And finally, on Azure Synapse Analytics, key point to remember about this is it's an analytic engine. It's designed to process large amount of data very quickly. Azure Synapse Analytics enable you to store the data you have read in and process locally within the service. Very important point. Azure Synapse Analytics leverages a massive parallel processing architecture, which is also MPP. This architecture includes a control node and a pool of compute node, as I show on the right hand side. If you see, there is a control node and there are compute nodes under that, which are doing massive parallel processing for the faster execution. Use cases where it is used, when we have very high volume of data, that is multi terabyte to petabyte size data set, very complex query and aggregation, data mining and data exploration, complex ETL operation, or low to mid concurrency when we need. So these are the key use cases for Azure Synapses, which you should remember. So with this, we are done with our CRAM. I hope this is useful and this is the timeline. So as you can see, this CRAM is pretty quick and you should be able to fit this in your schedule to get this exam done in two, three days. I hope you like it. Hit like, share and subscribe so that others can benefit from this video. And if you have any question, put a comment. I'll make sure I will answer it in a timely manner. Good luck for your exam. Thank you.